Good afternoon, Brother J.P. Timmons here of Christ Church International. Hope you're having a blessed day, blessed new year. I want to bring you a special message today that I'd planned to bring on New Year's, new year's Day regarding the new year, some revelation that the Lord shared with me. Uh, we, had, we made a trip up to Montana, had some work to do up there and so I'm just now giving it today, which is good because I got some special fresh revelation this morning concerning this message and I know it'll bless you and help you, especially orient your life in the new year. You know, God cares about all the facets of our life. We see that from the reading Jesus, especially the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about you know, us not worrying about what we, whether we have food to eat or clothes to wear, that type of thing. And we have a tendency to do that. And, of course, that was part of the problem when the parable of the sower was that the cares of the world choked the word and made it unproductive. And I hope the word's producing in your life. You know, the word of God should produce in your life. Because it's living and it's active. And, you know, people don't talk about that, but we try to talk about things and try, and the Lord gives us messages that no one else speaks about. So you may or may not think that it's important, but every facet of your life is important to the Lord. You know, Jesus said, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Think about that. Think about, you know, there's 11 billion people in the world. That's a lot of people to keep up with. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The Lord loves us so much. So the title of my message today is the more things change, the more they remain the same. And isn't that true? And you're going to really know it's true when you get through hearing how close to the end we are. And we had some angelic activity in our house last night, which we haven't had in a while. We used to have it a lot. And I tell people when they came to stay with us now, you know, if, if you hear a lot of moving around during the night, it's just the angels. And they kind of give you that <laughs> deer in the headlights look. But we have angels in our home and, and, you know, sometimes they're high, high order angels. And so they were, they were here last night. So praise the Lord. I was awake early praying and seeking the Lord and spending time with him because he is my first love and he loves us so much. You know, part of the problem with doing messages, whether it's preaching a message in church or whether it's teaching somewhere or whether it's doing a video like this or ministering in prison or whatever, you get the heart and the burden of the Lord for people and you see how much he cares about them. Uh, you know, I received a prophecy many, well, actually I received this prophecy a number of times when the Lord said, I put my heart within you and I began to realize how literally true that was because I, I can look at a person and I know how Jesus feels about them and even though there's maybe sin in their life you know he loves them and and that's the picture we have in the gospels isn't it so you know our world is changing it's really changed in the last few years and uh, actually that's very interesting that we've been looking into that and a lot of people now are coming to their senses, you know, and, and everywhere you go practically, like we were in Casper, Wyoming, and, you know, some 18 or 20-year-old uh, football player just dropped dead and, and that's happening all over. And I'll have more to say about that later, but, you know, 
the more things change, the more they remain the same. And we're going to see some examples of that in the scriptures today. So I'm going to give you the scriptures I'm going to be covering and then and you can write them down. And then uh, we'll get into the, to the message. Genesis 11, 1 through 9, Ecclesiastes 1, 9 through 11, chapter 2, 4 through 11, and chapter 12, 13 and 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 2 Peter 2, 1 through 8, Luke 21, 26, or actually we're going to read more verses in Luke. And then Zechariah 4, 6, and Acts <clears throat> chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, I believe. Yes. So praise the Lord. You know, history may not repeat itself. You've heard that phrase, I'm sure, but it certainly rhymes. So who better to get some wisdom from the words of the wisest man, created man. I always say that Solomon was the wisest man apart from the Lord who ever lived. But of course, I said this time that he was the wisest created man because of course Jesus was not created. So let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter one. We're gonna begin there, verses nine through 11. I know you're probably all familiar with this scripture. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now, isn't that interesting for a man who lived in 1000 BC to make a statement like There's nothing new under the sun. How many people would agree with that today? Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new, it hath been already of old time which was before us? And then in chapter 2, verses 4 through 11, I made me great works, I builded my houses, I planted my vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. He's talking about his labor of life, Amen. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold. And if you, if you look at how much silver and gold came to Solomon in a year, I mean, people were giving it to him. It's incredible. Spectacular wealth and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I get me men, singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. You know, that was a gift of God. Amen. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun." So he's, he's a man, wealthiest, one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest man of all time, concluding that it was vanity. So what should that teach us today? Well, I'll turn over to chapter 12. What should that teach us today about materialism? You know, Jesus himself said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So wealth is not in material things. Solomon came to that conclusion. He had, you know, he had all these wives and concubines and money. I mean, everything the world can provide, fine things he had it. And yet 
he really became bored and, and realized it was vanity. Well, you see, it's created within man and within our spirits that, that we want more than we see in this physical world. We want the spiritual because man is a spirit. Man's a threefold being, spirit, soul, and body. But we want more. And so you, you know, you'll never be satisfied no matter how much wealth you have. People sometimes, you know, in fact, in our society and, and even in the early church, you know, Paul was, was uh, making fun, frankly, of the quote, he called them super apostles and because they were saying they were better than Paul because they charged a lot of money for their conferences. Sounds kind of like today, doesn't it? But, you know, Paul was sort of making fun of them, calling them super apostles because what does that have to do with anything, you know? And so money and materialism is not important. Amen? And, and that's a lesson that we have to learn. That's one of the reasons why God expects you to give and tithe because he doesn't want your heart tied to money. He doesn't want anything interfering with your ability and your love for him. He wants to be number one. And if you hold things back, no matter what it is, then you're not putting the Lord first in your life and you're not being obedient. Amen. So Solomon, now this, these are really words of wisdom because he concludes Ecclesiastes, and I quote these a lot from, from memory. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. In other words, after all this is said and done, all this stuff in the world, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing. Think of all this secret stuff that's going on today, especially in government and in corporations, all the evil and wickedness. and It's all going to be exposed, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So our duty is to fear God, and there's no fear of God today. There's no fear of God in the world. There's no fear of God in the church, or very little. But that is our primary duty, according to a wise man, is to fear God and keep his commandments. You know, Jesus said that. He says, I'll tell you who to fear. Fear him who has power to cast you into hell. That's who you want to fear. And a lot of times people will disdain God and say bad things about the Lord. I hear it all the time, especially from Hollywood types but they're ignorant, they don't know the Lord. But they are a lot of times atheists. They'll talk about, about how you know God was killing people and that type of thing in the, in the Old Testament. But he did that for a reason. It's because they became evil. I mean, imagine, they, imagine taking your infant children and, and putting them on a red, red hot metal idol and sacrificing that child uh god i mean i'd want to kill you too i have to tell you you know that's just evil pure evil and and we're seeing more and more of that today that's one of the signs of the end as we'll see so solomon's message is that life a lot of life is vanity so you want to make your life count and how do you make it count by being obedient to the word of the lord and by by sowing your life into the kingdom of God. You know, Jesus said, take up your cross and follow him. And that he that loses his life will save it. Now, you know, another thing about the more, the more things change, the more they remain the same has to do with the governments. You know, the rise and fall of nations. I mean, don't we see that throughout history? And, you know, I've studied, I've studied a lot of history. I enjoy history. But it's interesting, the rise and fall of nations. And especially when you study it, most people have no clue about the spiritual aspects of it. But see, there are spiritual aspects to the rise and fall of nations. And don't we see that in only really one book in all of history? And that's the Bible. 
Because the Bible shows you the spiritual reasons why nations fall. And it's nearly always the same pattern. You see the same signs, which we, we've we really seen in America. And you know, the Lord told Evelyn and I that back in 2005, uh, actually, we, were, we ministered at this church in Oklahoma. And, and I, you know, the Lord told us that the Democrats would win both houses of Congress. And then after the, pres- the next presidential election, which was 2008, when Obama was elected, he said this country would go downhill really fast. And we're really seeing it now. And there are certain reasons for that. There's a timetable that the Illuminati and these groups have set up. And that's why they've done some of the things that they've done to be sure that certain people were not reelected and certain certain other things were not accomplished because they control the world for Satan. Amen. So governments rise and fall. We're hearing more and more today about globalism and the one world government. And, of course, the Bible prophesies globalism, but actually it began many years ago. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 11, and we'll see the roots of globalism. And we'll also understand the fact that this behavior is one of the one of the roots of sin in in the human race is that we don't want God we don't want God to tell us how to do anything we want to be our own God and that of course is the God of most countries today and it's it's the God of a lot of America secular humanism and it's it's really pretty ridiculous and comical when you think about it because if you look at the human race where we are today it, it's a, it's a strong a strong advocate that uh, evolution doesn't exist because we've certainly regressed instead of instead of evolved we we keep man men men and women keep doing the same evil things, you know. And isn't that prophesied that evil doers would wax worse and worse? And we're seeing that today. It's one of the signs of the Lord's return that we're going to discuss later. So in Genesis eleven, verses one through nine, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. See, you have to understand, you know, God created man in his own image, and he gave us brains, and and we learn, and we know how to do things, and, and that's what's happening here. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And so don't we see there the rise of globalism? And like today, 
Actually, and I, I was meditating on this and realizing that in the scientific community, we really are back to having one language, and it's the English language. You know, there are papers published in, in every language, but mostly they're in English, or they're trans always translated into English because that's the common language of the scientific community. And so, in a sense, we're back to that time by having one language. And, and also, the fact is that scientifically, we're at the stage where, you know, we're not only are, are doing all kinds of things that could, could almost all scientific inventions, uh, they arise out of, you know, someone funds a grant or this or that, but there's always good that can come out of it. But unfortunately, because of the heart of men and, gov and governments, it always turned it into evil, some type of weapon. For example, the the uh, genetic code. You know, they now have the ability to, frankly, eradicate a lot of diseases, and and yet they're not doing it. And there, of course, are reasons why that's not true. And then they're creating other other by by manipulating genetics. They're able to create viruses and things that are bioweapons. And uh, instead of using genetic science to help the human race, you know, we're on the verge of destroying the human race. And so that's another sign that God has to intervene because, frankly, we're not, we're not able to govern ourselves. We just, we're too immoral and we're too... Um, we're not smart enough. We don't have the wisdom. You know, they, most of the scientific community doesn't have the wisdom of God. And so they can create things, but they're dangerous. You know, one of those bioweapon viruses gets loose and it can kill half the world population. And of course, there are some people who want that to happen. But nevertheless, it's it's not wise to, you know, fool around with things that can destroy the human race unless that's your intent. And like I said, that uh, the immorality of the human heart and the desire for wealth and power and all these other things sometimes uh, circumvent what, what used to be considered moral behavior. You know, it used to be immoral for a drug company to come out with a drug that would kill you, but they've been doing it for years. I had a friend, he was in my uh, Pepperdine executive MBA class. He was the CEO of a drug company, and he, he told me about that, how, you know, the problems in the drug industry, and it's been going on for years. And it's not just there, it's other areas of, you know, the dollar is making money has become more important than people's safety. Well, it didn't used to be that way. It used to be, you know, you would never do something to endanger a human life unless you were in, in China. You know, Chinese were famous for that. Someone would have an accident, they just leave them there till they died. And so the rise of globalism is it doesn't bode well for the human race. The third item I have on the more things change, the more they remain the same is Hollywood, which is America's Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the reasons <clears throat> that our nation's under God's judgment, it uh, Hollywood continues to change, but unfortunately it's for the worse and not the better. Almost nothing good comes out of there anymore. You you can't hardly watch a movie if it's so full of profanity and vulgarity and and you know it's not just Hollywood. I mean Las Vegas is a lot that way and other places. It's just and and even even 
series they make for television now. You know, I was looking forward to watching things like Yellowstone or this new one, 1883, and you know, in Montana. And, but the language, people didn't, listen, people didn't talk that way back then. I mean, there might have been a few, but in those things, everybody uses the F word. Everybody does it. You know, I mean, it's just, in GD, it's just filth. And people didn't talk that way back then, especially in the present. You know, they'll talk in front of every. People didn't talk that way. And if they did use crude language, it never was in the, in the presence of the ladies. So that's what we've gotten from Hollywood. Number four, the nature of humanity, especially today, tends to argue against evolution. The human race has regressed to the point where we're back to the days that Jesus prophesied would be a sign of his second coming, the days of Noah and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Amen? And, you know, when you think about that, it makes you realize, you know, if you just... If you just read what Jesus alone said and see what's going on, you would understand that the Bible, that Jesus is who he said he was, the Messiah, the Son of God, Son of David, and that the Bible is true because what he prophesied is coming to pass. We're seeing it with our own eyes. And they saw it right away. You know, he prophesied, and we're going to read it later, he prophesied the destruction of the second temple. And that occurred about 37 years after he was crucified because it was 70 AD when the Roman general Titus destroyed the temple. And I always tell my Jewish friends, you know, if I said it was prophesied that the Messiah would stand in the second temple. I said the second temple doesn't exist anymore. So if Jesus wasn't the Messiah, who was? Who was the Messiah? Amen? You know, if you just read the word, it, it, it'll, it'll show you your error. I say all the time, you know, Jesus, the word says, Jesus said, John, the seven I am's of John, I am truth and the light Jesus confronted error because he was absolute truth and if you read absolute truth and meditate in the bible and study it you'll come to understand truth and that's what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 8 that if you continue in my word then you'll be my disciples and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free so praise the Lord. I always encourage people to spend a lot of time in the Word. And, you know, we, we're involved a lot in deliverance, and we have a questionnaire. It helps us cut down on time. I can read a questionnaire on someone, and, and I can tell you just reading it. I, I don't even have to get revelation, although I, I do get revelation when I pray over them, but I can just read their questionnaire, and I know what's wrong with them. And, and very often, you know, what... A couple of questions I ask on there is how much time per day do you spend studying the Word or meditating in the Word? How much time per day do you spend praying? How much time per day and hours do you spend speaking in tongues? And most of the time, people, they'll say less than an hour, which probably means less than 10 minutes. Well, there's your problem right there. Amen? You know, we can't kid ourselves. How much time you spend with the Lord is an indication of your relationship with him. Jesus himself said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, who will inherit the kingdom of God. Amen? So we need to be very watchful of our time and our priorities and make Jesus our number one priority. The people of God tend to remain the same as well. This is number five. Except for a few years of revival and renewal, we tend to go back to sleep and ignore the Lord's commandments. Or we don't learn from the past. You know, I, I know on my trips to Africa, 
I'm, I'm opening the Proverbs 10 here. I see that, you know, people don't plead the blood or they don't, you know, things, things we've learned, spiritual things we've learned or things I've taught people, I've learned from the spirit, like, you know, spend much time praying in the Holy Spirit. It's how you develop the eye of the eagle, pray in the spirit, which means praying in other tongues. Holy Spirit said that to me in 1980. He said, spend much time praying in the spirit or by the spirit. And as you pray in the spirit, you'll walk in the spirit and spiritual things will become more real to you. Amen. So spend a lot of time praying in the spirit. And, you know, if you need deliverance, you got spiritual problems. Amen. And you need to know what those problems are. And the best way to do it is to spend time praying in the spirit and fasting while you're doing that. You know, God's not going to do everything for you. A lot of times people expect God to do everything. Like we went to, we used to go to Portland a lot and minister and people would make appointments for deliverance. And the woman brings this college, her son, he's 20, 20 years old or 21. He's a college student there at Portland Bible College. And he couldn't talk. His, his speech was jumbled. And it happened to him when he started going to school there. So they made an appointment and, and, and I'm asking him questions and she keeps trying to answer for him. I said, let him talk. I said, we, you know, it was taking him a long time to get his words out, but I wanted to hear it. And that's how, what I felt led to do. And so it would take him, it would take him probably five minutes to answer one question. And we, Evelyn and I just sat there. And so when we got through asking questions, then I said, okay, I said, we'll, I said, we'll take him. I said, do you leave him here? I said, we'll pray over him all night tonight and maybe tomorrow. I said, I said, I said, probably, you know, one night or two nights and, and he'll, and the mother got angry. She jumped up off the couch. She said, well, my God's bigger than that. And so I said, well, let your God deliver him then. The people are just, they're goofy. You know, here we were. We're not being paid anything. We're going to spend two, night, all, two nights and days of our time to deliver her son, and no, uh-uh, no, no, my God's bigger than that. Well, okay, let your God handle it. And I suspect that he's probably still that way today. So we have to understand spiritual things, and, you know, we tell people all the time, our ministry, we've seen it. If you do what we say, you'll, you'll get results. If you don't, you won't. That's because we put a lot of time into praying over people and studying and meditating the word and we know the Lord and we know we know what moves the hand of God. And you need to understand spiritual things. It's like physical things, I say all the time. Spiritual things are like physical things. You know, if I'm gonna have my wisdom teeth removed, which I did, and three of them were impacted, it was very painful. Well, I want the best oral surgeon, you know, someone that's done that a number of times, not somebody that just got out of dental school. And so it should be the same about spiritual things. You know, find some people that, that you can, that can help you spiritually, and then do what they say. And uh, you'll increase spiritually and you'll be blessed, praise God, because the Lord did give fivefold ministry to perfect and equip the saints for the work of ministry. So now in Proverbs chapter 10, I'm talking about people going back to sleep. It was in 1998 when I was reading this. You know, I go through Proverbs every month. And I was reading this, so obviously it was on the 10th, the 10th of the month. And uh, the Holy Spirit called my attention to verse 5. It says, he that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest 
is a son that causeth shame. And then he said to me, don't forget, son, it's still harvest time. So we need to take that to, to heart ourselves and realize, you know, we're, we're in harvest. Jesus shouldn't be made to fish alone. We should be helping him get, gather in the harvest. Jesus said, it, when he was walking the earth, the fields were white. And think how much more white unto harvest they are today. Let's not be disgraceful sons and daughters, but let's be about the work of kingdom and getting people into the ark because Jesus is coming soon. Very, very soon. You know, we used to sing that song, soon and very soon, we are going to meet the Lord. Soon and very soon, we are going to meet the Lord. Love that song. Now, back in 1999, and I've shared this in my writings and preaching, the Lord said to me, I am building my church by revelation. By revelation. Well, this demonstrated to me the importance of revelation. I mean, I'd received a lot of revelation. I have received a lot of revelation from the Lord in dreams and visions and and just direct revelation speaking to me or taking me to heaven or different things that that have happened. Angels, fat angels come and hand me a scroll and I read it. And so God has many ways to speak to us, at least at least 23 ways that I found from the scriptures. But he said, I'm building my church by revelation. And this demonstrated to me the importance of revelation. Most of the church is taught that there's no such thing today. And based on what the Lord said to me, where do you think that teaching comes from? That there's no revelation today. And why would they say that? Well, if the Lord's building his church by revelation and you say there is none, then you're hindering, you're going to hinder the work of the Lord, aren't you? And we know who does that. It's Satan. It's not anyone else. And so Satan can speak through your pastor. He can speak through uh, lots of different people to dissuade you or to teach you error. That's why you got to be in the word yourself. So, they're still trying to do it the way they've always done it, through the plans of men instead of revelation from the Lord by his spirit. And Zechariah 4, 6, that was our license plate in Montana for years. Y'all should know Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by might and it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And if you don't, if you have not meditated on that verse of scripture, you should do it for a week. Just meditate on that. Read it over and over and over and over until it gets down your spirit. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. A lot of implications of that. Because without revelation by the spirit you don't know where to build a church or your ministry or anything you don't know it can be confirmed through personal prophecy but again that's the spirit that's the spirit working through the prophet's office normally it can be a human it can be a someone using the gift of prophecy but very often it's through the office of prophet but if you don't have fresh revelation by the Spirit, you don't know how to build or plant a church or ministry. And it doesn't just apply to evangelicals. I heard Mike Bickle say uh, on one of his teaching videos some years ago, a couple of years ago, that he'd only had one vision in his entire life. And so he didn't, he didn't believe people had a lot of visions. And he, didn't, he said he didn't trust people who said they had. And I thought, that's a goofy thing to say. Frankly, it's arrogant. It's like saying, well, if people got a lot of visions, I would get them, and I've only had one, so I don't believe and trust those people. 
Well, I've had thousands of them. You know, I didn't ask for most of them. They just came. That's spiritual gifting to say that because someone gets a lot of doesn't or gets a lot of visions, it that uh, you don't think it's from God. That's foolish. We don't see that in the scriptures. You don't see that with Isaiah. You don't see that with Jeremiah. You don't see that with Zechariah. Amen. Lots of visions to the prophets. Amen. So let's don't limit God. And it's another person who he didn't make an arrogant statement, someone I respect very much, although I never met him. That's David Wilkerson. He said he'd only had two visions in his entire life. But let's don't limit God by that. Amen. And let's realize that that's one of the main ways that he brings revelation. You know, how did Jeremiah get revelation? How did Isaiah get revelation? Let me show you this vision, Jeremiah. What do you see? Oh, I see an almond tree. Yeah, I watch over my word to perform it. So God's showing you a vision and he's teaching, he's telling you things, he's teaching you. He's showing you something. And very often it's because he wants to share his burden with the prophet. And he may share it with you, especially if you're, in, mainly he does it with prophets and intercessors. But he can do it with you if you're praying, if you or if you'll be an intercessor, or you'll intercede over your community. He'll begin to show you things. He'll begin to show you pastors in sin. He'll begin to show you racism or other things. Like when I was in Chester, South Carolina, the Lord showed me a lot, got a lot of visions about the problems in Chester, why they they are the way they are. So. He imparts revelation. And so what? He's building the church. And so it doesn't just apply to evangelicals. Amen. Praise the Lord. And of course, I talk about that in my book, The Prophetic Voice, the, the different ways that God gives revelation and the different types of visions that he gives but whether or not you receive visions, you must have revelation to build the church. In fact, and I'm going to demonstrate it to you today with a revelation that I received at 5 a.m. this morning when I was spending time with the Lord. And I noticed all that angelic activity going on in our house. Because you see, it requires revelation to even understand the word of God. Let's look at Acts chapter 8 now. You, you can't even understand the word without revelation. And that comes back to that equation the Lord gave me in 1997. True wisdom equals true knowledge plus true understanding. True wisdom is God's wisdom where you have the wisdom of God about a situation. That's not the word of wisdom, but that's true wisdom. And it's equal to true knowledge, which is the Bible. This is true knowledge. And true understanding, which comes where? From the Holy Spirit. He gives us understanding. And that's the symbolism in the tabernacle. The light, the, the lamp stand or candle stand was the only thing and, and that shine, shine light on the bread and it had fresh olive oil. The priests had to change that bread every day. What, is that, what does that symbolize? That means you need fresh bread every day. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone. He was speaking about physical bread, but we need spiritual bread. And that's why Satan builds false churches. I write about this in another gospel. You see, most false gospels or all false gospels are a mixture sometimes of the word and I call them a hybrid gospel. They're a mixture of the word and sawdust. So if your spirit's getting 20% word and 80% sawdust, your spirit's gonna you know, become emaciated. 
So the true gospel is based on the word. Amen? And false gospels are not. And all false gospels have one thing in common. They're sensual in nature. That's how you can spot like the prosperity gospel. Because it teaches you to acquire wealth so that you can buy this and that. No, it's that's sensual. That's that's not spiritual. You know, the, the gospel do, will prosper you, but it is to increase the kingdom and to allow people that you support to expand the kingdom of God and to win sinners and heal the sick and all the things that are accomplished through that. So the true gospel is spiritual in nature. You must be born again. Amen. Nicodemus said, hey, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. You know, those were the ruling Jews. They knew. He said, Rabbi, we know, we, it wasn't just him. We know you're a man sent from God because no one could do these miracles unless God was with him. Duh. So, but he didn't understand spiritual things. Read it there in John 3. Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel. You're a teacher and you don't understand these things. How can you teach people if you don't understand? You got to get the eye of the eagle. You can't teach people spiritual things if you don't know it. You know, God gave William Branham, the angel of the Lord, a, a vision one time. And, and he was trying to tie, to put in shoelaces in this baby shoes. And the laces were too big. They wouldn't go in the little baby shoes and everything. And the meaning of that vision was you can't teach spiritual things to, to Pentecostal babies. That's why you need to mature and grow up and understand spiritual things and develop the eye of the eagle. You know, what did Jesus say? Amen. What did he say about that? What does the word say? What did Paul, what did Paul write? By now you should be teaching, but you're, you're still on milk yourself. How are you going to teach anybody? So let's grow up. Let's grow up into Christ. That's why I'm here, that's fivefold ministry, to mature the body of Christ, grow up unto Christ. I want, I want to look at you and see Jesus Christ, mature Jesus Christ, amen. So let's, in Acts chapter eight, we see, this is uh, the testimony of Philip. You know, Philip was one of the original seven deacons and he got promoted to an evangelist. God sends him down to Samaria and there's a great revival, miracles, science, people saved, devils coming out of people, just tremendous time. But notice in verse 29, it says, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, how can I except some man guide me? He didn't have a revelation. He's reading, the, he's reading the scroll Isaiah, but he didn't understand what it meant because what? He didn't have the spirit. He, had, he needed someone to guide him. You need revelation to even understand the Bible. Anybody can read the Bible, but you can't develop true wisdom unless you're born again and receive the spirit of God to cast light on the word. How can I except some man should guide me and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? of himself or of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. 
what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said and answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And also shows you that he was baptized by immersion. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, which is about 18 miles away. Spirit caught him up like he would Elijah, took him to Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And what you find is that's where he made his home. And we see him later in the book of Acts. He had four daughters who prophesied. Praise the Lord. So Philip was promoted to office of evangelist. Now, the main revelation I want you to get for this new year is that you need revelation. Mark it down, write it down. I need revelation. The return of Christ is near. What are you doing to be a wise virgin and prepare yourself? Without revelation in the word, you cannot prepare yourself. How close are we to the end? Well, one way that you can tell is to tick off the prophecies that have been fulfilled and see how many remain. For instance, turn to Luke 21 now. We're going to read verses 1 through 36. And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Some of those stones weighed, stones weighed tons. And they asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. So the temple, that was 70 AD. You can tick that one off, okay? That's happened. How about people coming and saying they're the Christ or the anointed one? Yeah, we've seen a lot of that. There's probably more to come. There's one for sure that's going to claim to be the Messiah. Verse 9, But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. How many of those can you tick off? But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Amen. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer, for I will give you a mouth of wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall lay cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed, 
with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And don't forget, when Jesus began his ministry, he stopped in the middle of that quote in Isaiah. He didn't finish the day of vengeance of the Lord. He's saying these are going to be the days of vengeance. He's speaking about the last three and a half years. Jesus never talked about what scholars today call the tribulation period, seven years. He spoke of only great tribulation. And it's marked, as we see, by it's called the days of vengeance, and it's marked by the abomination of desolation. But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. They're calling that climate change, but a lot of it uh, is the judgment of God. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree in all the trees. And he begins to talk about that. So, we see, when we, we start ticking off everything that's come to pass, it's been prophesied, that would be signs of the return of Christ. Lawlessness will multiply. We're really seeing that today. And there wasn't that, one of the signs of the days of Noah. The love of many will grow cold. The good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the world. The days of Lot and the days of Noah. Now, the days of Noah, violence covered the earth. And what does the word say? The thoughts of men's hearts were only evil continually. <clears throat> and we're really seeing that today. So many evil people, evil thoughts all the time. They will hand you over for persecution. You will be hated by all nations because of my name. You say you're a Christian, they're going to hate you. We really haven't seen that, but we're beginning to see it. We're seeing the rise of it. And the Lord told me in Williston, Montana, in Williston, North Dakota, in 2014, that the greatest persecution against the church was going to come in America. Many will take offense, betray, and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and deceive many. And you can write down 2 Peter 2, 1 through 8. He prophesied this as well. And of course, we're seeing a lot of false prophets. The abomination of desolation takes place, and that signals the last three and a half years. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. So what about that one? Men's hearts failing them for fear? That's what we're seeing today. That was the revelation I got this morning. I knew this was going on, but I hadn't, I hadn't even thought of, I hadn't even, I hadn't even connected it to that scripture. People are dropping dead. You know, the greatest cause of deaths in Alberta, Canada is, is unknown causes. And, and all these 17-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 20 year they're just dropping dead of cardiac arrest. Why? Well, the answer's out there. It's plain. It's obvious. Pregnancies. 300% increase. 300% increase in cancer. 300% increase in stillbirths. All these things. But he said... 
men's hearts would be failing them for fear. 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 That's what the devil uses. That's what his servants use. Put fear in your heart. You'll sign away your freedom. You know, you'll, you'll go along with the Patriot Act. Put fear in your heart and you'll, you'll take the jab. But what are the results? You know, what are we seeing now? Men's hearts failing them. And then just put um, died suddenly in your Google search and see what comes up. And there's a, there's actually a, um, a video on it. You can see it on Rumble. I think there's a, another version on YouTube, but it, it's going to probably be taken down or watered, or just watered down. But you can you can view it on Rumble. Died suddenly, and you'll understand what's going on. But men's hearts are failing them for fear, fear. And what's the great fear now? Well, what's the next, what's the next pandemic? What's the next? People are afraid. You, you know, it became, it came so bad. If you weren't, if you didn't, if you weren't vaccinated, I mean, they, they were about ready to crucify you. What is that? That's mass paranoia and fear. <coughs> Excuse me. So then we see Jesus coming in the clouds, power and great glory. So tick face all those things off your list and see how many are left and you'll see how close we are to the return of Christ. And I have a specific word from the Lord about that. When the angel Gabriel appeared to me in 1982 in April and he said, when the end is near, you'll be told where to go and what to do. So I've never been too concerned about it. But men's hearts failing them, who would have thought that this was going to be caused by something such as it, that it's on a mass scale that it is today, excuse me, and that it's becoming. So I want to encourage you for this year to develop the spirit of wisdom and revelation and develop the eye of the eagle and to spend more time with the Lord. And so I want to pray to that effect. And I want to encourage you to go to our website, www.ccipublishing.net. You can order Bibles and our books and teachings and that help you. And there's some archive before we started doing videos a couple years ago, there are archived teaching articles on there that will help you as well and other resources that are available. Praise the Lord. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters, Lord, that are watching this video, Lord. I pray that your spirit will be imparted to them in a new and fresh way, Lord, and that you would encourage them and help them develop the eye of the eagle and to spend more time praying by the spirit spending more time in the word, more time with you, Lord, more time fellowshipping with you, which you desire all of us, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful for all that you do for us. So Father, right now, I just pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be upon my brothers and sisters now for an impartation of your glory and your grace and your love and your revelation, Lord, because you said you're building your church by revelation and we all need revelation. So I just pray, Lord, that you would give each one watching this, give them a special revelation so that they'll know that it's important to you and that they'll know that you plan to use them through revelation and through knowledge. And so I thank you for it, Father, and I praise you and honor you and glorify you in Jesus' name. Hope you have a blessed week. We'll see you soon. Brother J.P. Timmons, Christ Church International.